To quote a common influencer line, a lot of you have been asking me about this car. Okay, so not a lot of you have been asking, but a few people have been. Along with that, I've actually been challenged by a couple people to review some of my family vehicles, especially now because we're all under lockdown and there's basically nothing else to do. So hello everyone, I am EA40, and right here we have a car that you will not see in Europe, the Lincoln MJT. Here we are, looking at a 2017 Lincoln MKT. This is not the same kind of Lincoln MKT that livery and chauffeur companies use, but this is one that is more suitable for the entire family. This car arrived at the start of the previous decade, as Lincoln realized they needed a luxury SUV that could seat more than just five people, while appealing to suburban families without being as large as an American suburban family home is, like the Lincoln Navigator. Consequently, this six the seven-seater model is relatively short and relatively low. And depending on whom you ask, it's relatively unattractive. The first Lincoln MKTs, the front end of that, it looked like a shark. It was very polarizing. It was like in your face. It was quite a little bit to look at. When they updated it for 2013, they ended up making it a bit more subdued, but it looked like a whale. This one, I don't even know what to describe it. I guess the more politically correct way of describing it is an acquired taste. That's probably the best way of putting it. As far as the back end of this car goes, I relatively like this design. It's nice and sleek with this nice long light bar. The only thing I don't really like is this backup camera with the way it just juts out like that. I'm not really a big fan of it. But otherwise, I like the back end of this car, even though it looks a little bit too much like a whale. So I guess the whole car almost looks like a whale then when you also consider the side profile. So we have established that the exterior of the Lincoln MKT is a bit of a mixed bag and can look like an aquatic animal. That's not very great when it comes to sales and making a good first impression. Perhaps the interior has some redeeming qualities, does it? Yes it does. But let's get some of the bad out of the way first. Some places such as the seat controls and such, I don't like the hard plastics around here. And then other places have a bit of questionable fit and finish that you wouldn't see on some of the German competitors, for example. But all that bad stuff aside, it's actually surprisingly good in here. Around the instrument cluster, you have two displays to flank the speedometer. Everything's relatively easy to see. You have about an eight inch touchscreen here and it runs the Sync 3 infotainment system. It still controls some things that I prefer to have buttons such as the heated and active cooled seats. Yes, this car does have that, along with the heated steering wheel. I wish there were buttons for it, but it's controlled in the touchscreen. I guess that's where things have been going anyway. Otherwise, things are pretty easy to use, easy to find. There are a couple buttons to enable the lane keep assist, which helps you just stay in your lane. And then also there's active park. This car can parallel park itself. It really isn't bad up front, but the real party is in the second row, where this one is optioned with a refrigerator. Now, here's the thing about this back seat, because it's a six seater model that we're in, and there's an option to have a seven seater model, but there's a reason why we went with the six. When you had that seven seater option with three in the middle, we found it got a little bit cramped and we just didn't quite like that. Whenever you have that six seater option, the car automatically comes standard with heated and active ventilated seats in the second row, something you don't see in a lot of SUVs. But we didn't think that was good enough either because Lincoln offers an extended middle row console and when you have that console, you get the option of a beverage cooler. Now it can be a little bit more than just a beverage cooler as there are a couple controls that you can either refrigerate or even freeze stuff. So that's right, that's what can also help a little bit with making it a family vehicle because on like a hot summer day or something, you can dump a bunch of ice cream bars in this refrigerator and make it on the freeze option and then have a blast as you go on a road trip. Honestly, the second row, it's where to be in this car. I mean, the leg room in here is great. You have a nice extended console and stuff. You can store stuff in here. You have the refrigerator back here and it's just a nice place to be overall. There's even a bit of lumbar support. And like I said, heated and active ventilated seats along with your own climate control back here. Now, I'm not Tyler Hoover. I don't have any kind of gray poupon or anything to drop out the window and it wouldn't look very good for me to do that either since everything is short in the grocery stores. So I'm just gonna exit the way I entered. 
Now where I live is under a stay at home order and that means it wouldn't be very responsible for me to go out and give you guys a driving impression right now. However, here are a few hints as to what you can expect out of this car. The power comes from a 365 horsepower twin turbo V6 engine. The curb weight of this vehicle, once you have someone like me in it, it's going to be a little bit over 5,000 pounds. Does that make it quite the porky SUV that you'd expect? No, actually. The center of gravity on this is pretty low and the ride is actually quite good. And one good clue of everything, when you look at the visor, you don't see a sticker of shame that a lot of similar SUVs get that say, oh, higher rollover risk, avoid abrupt maneuvers at excessive speeds. This one doesn't have that. And that's really good for where I live around the Pittsburgh area where there are a lot of curvy roads and hills. Dare I say it, this car can actually be a bit fun to drive on some of these back roads. Makes you wonder why people are getting bigger SUVs that seat the same number of people but weigh even more than that and aren't really as fun to drive around the curves. Like, why? Get something that's a little bit more direct. This one floats well anyway. Those other ones don't float much better. Just, why get something that can't really handle? Doesn't make sense to me. With fun driving dynamics, some good features, a somewhat amazing interior, and more, perhaps this is a compelling car to buy. But it isn't. At least it's not compelling to buy it new. When this car came out of the factory, it was about 57,000 US dollars with almost all the options added onto it, except for the rear seat entertainment, which you should skip that because it was pretty old. But anyway, that's about how much it cost. However, I won't disclose the pricing that we bought it at pre-owned because it's not really my business to disclose it, but here are some hints. The first buyer had this car for about a year and put about 7,000 miles on it, and the car cost $57,000 when he bought it back in 2017. However, when we ended up purchasing it, let's just say that in that year and 7,000 miles, Perhaps the car's price was closer to $30,000 than it was to even $45,000. Residual value it does not have, comfort it does have, fun dynamics it does have, but in production it is not, as the new Lincoln Aviator has its place in the lineup. But despite its flaws, I will still say that when it was sold, the Lincoln MKT was one of the most compelling SUVs in its class. That is, once you got over the acquired taste looks. So as I'm walking around filming, I noticed this. This looks like a bit of paint that, uh, yeah, it's come off for some reason. Warranty, here we come. Uh, yeah, that's not very good in terms of finishing quality. Ugh, how does that happen?